They were not a dysfunctional family. The 400 block of West Euclid Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. It could be any town USA. The distinction though, is that at 422 West Euclid Avenue is where the Barbara Colvin story begins. children, probably about that size, when they moved right there in that house, they grew up right there in that house. And I, they used to play, to come over here with, uh, Barbara used to come play with my daughter. I have six children, and she used to run around here with my daughter, my middle daughter. And we saw a lot of each other, and they, they've always been a very loving family. I grew up in the church. I was an individual. My father was the Ministry of Music. Um, my mother, she didn't attend church, but certainly she would always get us ready for church. And so um, I grew up in the church. I, grew, I was at church for choir practice. I was at church for Bible study. I was at church for the usher board meeting. Lord have mercy for the cat meeting, the dog meeting. I was there. You name it, I was there. But what happened to me is I was just an individual who was sitting on the pew. In December of 1990, I had been arrested for the 56th time. I was addicted to heroin at the age of 15, and um, the onset of that happened when I was 13. At the age of 15, I was also prostituting. I was ex expelled from, um, from high school, uh, so I was unable to go back. The streets were more glamorous to me um, than my home environment. I was a deputy sheriff uh, when I first met Barbara in 1981. The first I heard of Barbara was when they told their war stories of booking her in at the old jail and things that happened over there and how they would have the police call ahead if she was arrested uh, so they could get ready for her. Oh God, notorious. Notorious is the word. Um, heard a lot about Miss Colvin. Um, a robber, a thief, you just, you know, you didn't cross her. This is the street uh, on East Main Street uh, where I uh, lived the majority of, of my time uh, prostituting, turning tricks. Back in the 80s, this was the strip. Prostitution, theft. I'm sure she's beat up and robbed people. If she was, uh, um, with a trick or something, some of the things that she would do, you know, to get their money. Robbing a guy, pickpocketing a guy's pocket so that, so that I could use drugs. This is, this is where we would go to buy drugs, to shoot drugs, to snort drugs and, and everything. First time that uh, I met with Barbara uh, face to face would, would be at the old county jail and uh, she uh, knew the law better than I did. Uh, she probably knew the law better than most of the officers in the jail. And uh, she uh, never hesitated to remind them of that. She was an amazing person in, in, in that people, not just because she was physical, but she seemed to be able to hold court. It became a game, a dangerous game. She was something to be dealt with on the street. If you took her corner, or moved into her space or her territory, she let you know. I, I literally thought in my mind that I owned this street. From the 80s all the way up through the 90s, you know, we were incarcerated several times. I had to have bonded her out. I mean, I'm honestly 10 to 15 times at least, and chased her many times when she failed to appear in court at least 20 or 25 of those arrests, 56 times that I had been arrested, came with me being violent. 
this right here is uh, West Pleasant Street. Um, West Pleasant Street was also known back in the 80s for um, a large amount of where uh, drugs was being distributed. It was also a, a place um, right here in this lot right here is where I was brutally raped. This house right here, um, I lived in in the 1980s uh, in two or three of the, of the various apartments. Um, and even when I wasn't living there, I would, it was always a partner of mine that would always uh, uh, be here. So basically you, you could say that I was in every apartment that was in here doing okay. some type of criminal activity. And when she sat up one day in the group and told us that the bottom line was that all of us in the room was not going to make it. She said, some of you will be back. She said, some of you will die as a, a result of this disease, you know. And she was putting everything out there. And when she started talking to us like that, you know, a light came on. I said, you mean to tell me that I have choices? you know, that I can actually be in control of what happens to me in my life because I always thought that I would die out there in the streets in my addiction, you know. And then uh, when she said that some of us was going to die, I was looking at her like, well, what you looking at me for? But then what happened is, uh, you know, later on, everybody in the group thought that she was looking at them. You know, so it all gave us something to really think about. And I really, I really, really, really thought about it. And at that point, at that point is when I made up my mind that I had some serious issues to deal with. And that if I didn't deal with them, they were gonna deal with me. <sighs> From that point on, I went on a self journey of discovering who I was. The Lincoln Park neighborhood of Springfield, Ohio was totally renewed. It was once home to crime, prostitution, rundown buildings, abandoned homes. Barbara Colvin called it home as well. The Lincoln Park neighborhood is totally changed. And so too is Reverend Barbara Colvin. After spending her teens and young adult years in and out of jail, in 1991, Barbara began what would be her last jail term at Marysville. Barbara first got motivated, then she got educated. She made relatively rapid progress moving from her old life to her new one. She was released from prison in 1993 and soon after was working at Hannah Neal, then on to Project Linden several years later. By 1999, she had graduated from Columbus State Community College, and by 2000, she was a certified counselor. Barbara accepted the call to preach and soon after graduated from Wilberforce University. She kept herself well informed through continuing education courses and in the process received numerous awards and recognition for her work in the community, eventually gaining her a place in the who's who of Columbus publication. Barbara was ordained in the AME Church, and by 2008, Reverend Colvin was named director of the prison ministry for the 3rd Episcopal District, that after leading the prison ministry at her home church, St. Paul AME in Columbus, Ohio. How you doing, Josh? I'm doing good. Yes. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We heard rumors years ago you were alive and working in Columbus, and I, I was surprised to hear you were still alive. <laughs> And I can remember a particular time that she woke me up and she had gave me a, a, a scripture and she had said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I have anointed you to preach the gospel. And I said, Barbara, that sounds like you being called to the ministry. When she was looking at going into the ministry or, you know, answering the call uh, uh, 
to the ordained ministry and, 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 and what that entailed. And, uh, but once again, she overcame all of the obstacles. I, the first time I saw her, and years had passed, again, I only recognized her because of her voice. I couldn't believe how she looked. She looked fabulous. She looked wonderful. She was articulate. She looked like a professional person. I was blown away. I then went on to receive my Associates of Applied Science in Mental Health, Chemical Dependency, and Mental Retardation. Um, and after that, I went on to receive my bachelor's degree. I have two of them. The first one is I have a BA. I have been born again. <laughs> The second bachelor's that I have is a bachelor's of science in health services administration from Wilberforce University where I graduated magna cum laude. Reverend Colvin is someone who really was someone in the streets as she clearly articulates and shares, but is someone who saw that her life was better than that and used that as her transition point and used her negative past, her short negative past, to really transition into someone who's going to give back to the community. There are many ways to be involved in the prison ministry. Some are obviously more complicated, more difficult, and maybe even more dangerous. But it, ran, it runs a gamut, all the way down to just getting people to prison to visit relatives. I mean, you can be involved in prison ministry. She knew about all of them. She understood all of them. She was, committed to, she was committed to all of them. And she was deeply concerned about the church, about the church being actually a part of ministry. And in, uh, the way she explained it to me, the church had done so much for her. Um, it had accepted her and allowed her to be rehabilitated into the community. And her story was, I mean, many times there were tears in my eyes when I heard her tell a story. And understand that those individuals that you had thought were an outcast, that you thought would never be anybody, that you thought would, uh, 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 could never, because if the Lord had told me, that 20 years ago, Lord have mercy, that I would be running around the country talking to little white ladies and little black ladies. Come on now, let's keep the real up in here. I met Barbara Colvin when she was hospitalized because she wasn't doing well. She actually had heart failure at the time. Um, we were kind of desperate. Uh, she was really doing poorly. Um, and, uh, and there wasn't, she was on great medical therapy and there wasn't much else to be done. I think it was a time when we were really lucky because uh, one of the cardiologists here was actually doing research and trying to figure out why um, a, a special type of pacemaker called a biventricular pacemaker that is used in patients um, who are doing poorly. Um, most of the time patients feel better when that actually is put in and she uh, did not. And so we needed to figure out whether or not there was a reason for that, if there's something else we could do. Unfortunately, at this point, it was really the choice between life and death. We uh, offered her a mechanical heart. She was very fixated on whether her quality of life would be okay because she's a very religious person. She was comfortable with her time on earth and if her quality of life was gonna be very poor, she did not want to do this. Um, and so she realized that it really wasn't gonna be so bad and agreed to do it. And uh, she's been doing fantastic ever since, always with a big smile. She can't go through much more difficult of a time than she has. And I think that really speaks to her, her perseverance, her persistence, her tenacity, and her spirit, and her love of the Lord. And to see the amount of grace and beauty that she uh, showed and her confidence that God had given her this new 
new bench here, and that she uh, was was always showing that that who was in command. It's like the song that says, "If I can help someone along the way, then my living will not be in vain." And that's Barbara. Oh,